My name is Kathy Braid. Welcome to the Braid Gallery. The work that I have hanging today is the work of my late husband, Paul Braid. There's a bridle hanging on the wall. Paul was born on March 28, 1920, to Doris and Henry Braid. Paul and I were married in 1963, and together we raised four children in Fort Saskatchewan. Upon Paul's arrival in Alberta, he continued his passion for building houses by building his own home overlooking the river valley in Fort Saskatchewan. Paul worked for Sherritt Gordon for 25 years, retiring in 1975, when he dedicated more time to teaching and painting. Paul's grandfather, Henry Bradley Clark, was born in Birmingham and, ra and raised in Perry Sound, Ontario, was trained as a cabinet maker. His grandmother, Muriel Ann Vosper, was raised in English boarding schools because her parents were actors. Muriel was an artist who came to Canada and supported herself by painting designs on ladies' ballroom dresses in the late 1800s until she married. Their daughter, Doris Clark, one of three children, married Henry Braid in 1911. The grandparents lived with a family on Conlon's Road in Highland Creek, close to Toronto. His grandfather, Henry Clark, known as Harry, taught the boys carpentry after school hours, and Paul later took these skills with him when he began to build houses. At 13 years of age, Paul found his grandmother's oil box, and by 14, he had used them all up. It was the year 1947 that Paul Bray graduated from the Ontario College of Art, Toronto after serving with the RCAF during the last part of World War II. Paul's graduating picture, a large still life, was chosen to hang at the National Gallery in Ottawa for some time. Paul's instructors at the Ontario College of Art included Franklin Carmichael of the Group of Seven. Right after the war, it seemed that there were no job openings for artists, so Paul went back to doing carpentry and was hired by Sherritt Gordon Mines in Ottawa in 1953. He was asked to remodel a house for the manager of the company. When he asked for the address of the place, he was told that it was in central Alberta. Paul then packed up his tools and headed west in his 1950 4CV French Renault. This happened to be the hottest part of the summer, so Paul drove down the highways with the front door of the car propped open, the car doors open to the front. This car's unique design 
has had two sons restoring it at different times during their summer breaks from college. The car still sits in its shed at the back of the Bray property in Fort Saskatchewan. After finishing the house, Paul was given the job of maintenance supervisor at Sherritt Gordon till 1975 when he left to paint and teach art for the University of Alberta's Department of Extension. When the coal mines near the mountains started to close down in the early 1950s, many of the towns became abandoned. In 1965, Paul and his artist friend Murray Allen took a trip out to the coal branch and found the old buildings at Painter's Haven. There were many weekend trips made out there before the government stepped in and began to burn the buildings down due to their unsafe condition. The University of Alberta heard about the interesting Sundance structures built by the First Nations people in the Kootenay Plains area and began to offer outdoor camping workshops nearby during the summer months of 1971. This was also the area that Chief Smallboy and his 200 followers moved to from the town of Hobima. We were able to visit the small boy camp and paint the odd teepee before the government gave them land on which to make a permanent settlement. The natives of the band were also hired to cut down the trees in that part of the North Saskatchewan River Valley before it was flooded to create the present Lake Abraham. During Canada's centennial year of 1967, Many service groups and clubs were commemorating the event with special projects. The local historical society, with its few members, tried raising funds by inviting speakers and selling hasty notes. Old photographs of the town were featured, and Paul was approached to do a possible reconstruction of the original fort. This was painted in monochrome for reproduction since the society could not afford color reproduction at that time. After spending so much time on preliminary sketches with Peter Ream, Paul thought he'd try to do a large scene of the fort activities in color. The painting still hangs in the library room of Pioneer House in its original hand-built frame. Peter Ream's resource book on local history featured Paul's colored reconstruction of the fort on its book jacket. I recall a very special open house when we invited our Lieutenant Governor Grant McEwen to be our speaker for 1973. It was to our amazement that he accepted. Paul's posters announcing this event were hung all over town. It was held on December 2nd and Pioneer House was full of people bulging at the scenes. That was before the building was enlarged. Dr. McEwen introduced us to many remarkable characters that colored our early history. From 1971 to 1999, Paul had taught landscape painting in 35 towns, including our local group here. The Alberta scenes that he painted after class time were from all parts of the province. Edmonton Journal's cartoonist John Yardley Jones joined the workshops in the 1980s and surprised us all by writing a full-page story about the workshops and illustrated it by several cartoons. One workshop took us to Grand Cache for the week. We settled into the campsite at the edge of town late Sunday night. Since our daughter Laurel had come with us, I found our little bowler trailer difficult to move around in. After supper, I had moved the fully loaded meat cooler outside and then forgot about it. During the night, we heard noises, so Paul got up to investigate. A big bear was startled by the door opening, and then he picked up the handle of the cooler in his mouth and disappeared into the bushes with our week's meat supply. Paul cartooned the incident in our annual Christmas letter that year. Paul's sense of humor stood him in good stead, 
when he thought of jotting down in cartoon form the problems his students had been having. The end result, after eight years' work, was a small manual called Painter's Handbook, which is on sale now for $10. Paul became a member of the Alberta Society of Artists in 1980 and exhibited with them for years. He was elected president of the Society in 1987 which enabled us to attend the Governor General's reception and concert at the Alberta Jubilee Auditorium in September. Since it was also our 25th anniversary that year, we dressed formally and had our photograph taken as well. The university's art classes for seniors in May from 1987 on were well attended. The last week, the group painted a large mural. This was designed and laid out on a large panel by Paul. The rest of the work was then done by the students. Several of them hang in Kelsey Hall and several had been donated to the General Hospital's Caritas Care Center. John O'Henley, a former classmate of Paul's, visited in the summer of 99. The two hadn't seen each other for 50 years, but had been faithfully sending each other homemade Christmas cards all those years. The Alberta's Spaces and Species calendar featured Paul's painting of his Kootenay Plains for that year. A fellow painter and group troubadour Don Jancy wrote and sang about Paul's daily schedule written on a paper pie plate. Paul used it to make out a schedule and then post it in the camp kitchen. Don sang the song and to the tune of a bridle hanging on the wall by Wilf Carter. <laughs> The name of the song was The Pie Plate Hanging on the Wall. Paul's last workshop was well attended at Artra Arts Center on October 16, 1999. Later, Paul visited his daughter Allison and her family in Victoria in late November and passed on there December 3rd, just a few weeks short of the millennium. Paul's patience with his students and his quiet sense of humor were well remembered at his memorial on December 9, 1999. The U of A's outdoor painting sessions did not come to a halt with Paul's passing in 1999. A group of painters which call themselves the Paul Braid Alumni Group still meet there for a week's unstructured art sessions. This group wisely heads out there in August when the no -see flies have completed their life cycle. The Kootenay Plains area is known to the natives as the Meadow of the Winds. The Fort Saskatchewan Library and Local Naturalist Society hosted an opening art show of Paul's Kootenay works in the spring of 2003. The centuries-old Indian Sundance meeting place is located 20 kilometers east of the Banff Jasper Road on the David Thompson Highway. Paul's smocks quickly became encrusted with heavy paint as he lost himself in his painting. His left arm held the palette since his paints were always in the same order. The left arm of his smock was continually being covered with brown paint. His students commented on his messy smocks. On one occasion, one of the students from the Westlaw class presented Paul with a new smock at the end of the session. That student, Janine Chalifou, from Westlock, had bought a pattern 
and stayed up all night sewing for him. On the wall, there's a horse you nailed above the door. It's a shoe that our old pony wore. There's a faded and Paul said he never built a house without a fireplace. I love its warmth and the memories we share. This afghan was knitted by a community group in Toronto and was raffled off for 25 cents a ticket. Paul's mom asked Paul if he had a quarter and surprised Paul by winning. It was left to us as a keepsake. This was the last self-portrait Paul painted before he passed away in 1999. I was working at the dining room table on my own self-portrait with my pastels spread all over the table. I was completing my studies for a certificate of fine art at the University of Alberta. Paul came along and could not help but pick up the pastels and illustrate a, a cross-stitching technique to help with my self-portrait. Because Paul would never use someone else's piece of work to demonstrate on, he began through his demonstration of his own self-portrait. From this resulted his final self-portrait. This was done in June of 1999. Bye.